those Brexit negotiations could begin at the end of next week. I keep promising Cathy they'll start. Uh, there's still a bit of work to do, though, in the UK Parliament on the Brexit bill before the Prime Minister can formally trigger Article 50. And I do still believe you, by the way. One of the chief architects of Brexit is, of course, Nigel Farage of the UK Independence Party. And as many of you will know, he is a man who sometimes dines with Donald Trump. We were speaking to him a short time ago. Mr Farage, good evening. Good evening. Um, we're about to hear an interview with uh, Dr Fuchs from Germany, who, as you know, is a close ally of Angela Merkel. And in our interview, I asked him a question about the severance payment, the alimony, if you will, for the UK to pull away from the EU. It's estimated to be around 60 billion euros and I asked him if that was negotiable and he said no not really well uh, the truth is uh, we're paying the alimony already it is now nearly nine months since we voted to leave the European Union um, assuming article 50 gets triggered let's say by the end of this month um, and we go through a further two years we will net not gross but net have paid almost 30 billion pounds into the European Union coffers between voting to leave and leaving. And you know what? I think that's plenty. But the issue is it's already a big stumbling block before we even get to the nitty gritty. Well, look, as I say, we're paying a net 30 billion anyway. The idea we're going to pay another 50 or 60 billion, it isn't going to happen. They can go and whistle for it, frankly. The row in Britain today, after the budget yesterday, is about the tax rise on the self employed. And this morning, the Chancellor of the Exchequer has been doing the rounds in the UK. Uh, he's been forced to break an election promise, or at least that's the way it's being portrayed. He appears to be blaming Brexit. Is this a sign of things to come? Well, no, I mean, they're very good at blaming Brexit. Um, they promised us that the sky would fall in. Uh, actually, nearly all the economic data coming out of the UK is really good and certainly much better uh, than it is in the Eurozone. Um, I think it was a very badly judged budget. I mean, the people that voted for Brexit were the small and medium-sized businesses, sick to death of too much regulation coming from Brussels, believing that a Brexit vote would see a UK government on their side, and to put taxes up on sole traders and the self-employed was, I think, a big political mistake. Uh, Mr Farage, I wanted to ask you uh, about your relationship with the United States at the moment. It seems that congratulations are in order. You've become Britain's man in Trump land. What's that like? Well, I have to say this to you. I did support Donald Trump during the campaign. Um, I shared a platform with him in Mississippi. Um, I came back to all the debates and, you know, took part in the spin room discussions and everything. Um, I, I'll say this to you. Uh, I saw him a couple of weeks ago. I had dinner with him, as you know. Um, one thing really struck me. This guy believes that he has a contract with the American people. He was elected on a ticket, elected on a manifesto, and come hell or high water, he is going to deliver that manifesto. And I think in democratic terms, that's refreshing. And in terms of the man himself, uh, I have to say, I really believe this guy has got very strong moral courage. He wants to see this through. So, so that's your political relationship, and you have a sense of conviction that you share with him. We've seen the yeah. photographs of the two of you together, though, and it seems to go beyond that. There seems to be some kind of personal chemistry there when you had dinner with him at Trump Tower. And I was just wondering, why do you think it is that you and he get on so well? Well, there's one thing we have in common, and that is that we're probably the two most vilified people in the West over the course of the last <laughs> couple of years. I mean, everybody, everybody has thrown just shed loads of abuse at us. Uh, so we have, a, you know, we've sort of been through the same baptism of fire, as it were, uh, with the media and with other political commentators. And I think that, uh, you know, I think uh, that what Donald Trump, and not just him, but the people around him, I think what they see is that I was a pretty lonely warrior uh, battling for Brexit for over two decades. Uh, we finally got there, um, and I think Team Trump believe that they would not have won had it not been for the dynamism and the optimism that Brexit gave people who don't normally bother to vote. So right. I think they're very pleased. And look, I'm, you know, I'll be honest with you, um, I've known some of the people around Donald Trump for many, many years. Uh, they are uh, what I would regard as friends. How often That's do you talk? Great. Do you talk often? Oh, you know, you're asking me questions now that you know I'm not going to answer. Um, I'm not going to. <laughs> Worth I'm not try. going to. Well, of course, I mean, that's your job. Uh, no, I'm not going to betray 
any personal confidences or discuss, you know, specifically anything that we talk about. Uh, but, you know, I have a good relationship with Donald Trump and his team in the White House. And if I can be of any help to them or any help in forging a new relationship between my country and theirs, I'm only too happy to do so. One of the issues, Mr. Farage, that, that we talk about over here is... Um, is whether you serve as a sort of unofficial ambassador for the UK. Perhaps the UK government don't want that. But we also read that the UK Independence Party has set up a, a sort of de facto embassy in Georgetown, this building that serves as a place to meet people. Is that true? Are you, are you sort of using it as an embassy to meet people from the administration? Well, point number one is whatever I do is in an unofficial capacity. Uh, number ten, uh, do not want me in any way at all. Fine. That's up to them. I think it's actually rather short-sighted and rather silly. I think there is a constructive role I could play with them. So anything I do is unofficial. Um, as for the embassy, well, I understand that Aaron Banks has taken a five-year lease on a house in Georgetown, uh, which he says, incidentally, will have a very good uh, dining room and wine cellar. Uh, beyond that, I don't... Honor, beyond that... Uh, I mean, it sounds like fun, um, but beyond that... I it's really my neighbourhood. I'll be round the corner. Yes, Cathy and I'll come and visit. Oh, well, come and we'll see us. Do, please, please. Now, before I let you go, Mr. Farage, I have to ask you about a, a photograph, which I'm sure you're aware is doing the rounds on social media today. It's of you coming out of the Ecuadorian embassy. I think your radio producer is in tow, so I perhaps know why you were there. But it has been said, and it's being said on Twitter, that you've been there to interview Julian Assange. And there's also that talk that you are serving as a back channel to Mr. Assange for the Trump team. Is that true? Uh, all I can tell you is I was in that building today, as you know, uh, the Ecuadorian and the Colombian assembly uh, and, and, and embassies are in that building. Um, and I'm not at the moment going to confirm or deny what I did at all. You'll have to wait and see. I'll listen to your programme at the weekend. Thank you very much, <laughs> Nigel Farage. Good to be with you. Yes, interesting timing, Cathy, given that uh, Julian Assange has been speaking today about that big dump of CIA documents, and there's Mr Farage coming out of the Ecuadorian embassy. Anyway, he didn't want to talk about that. But what did you make <laughs> about this relationship that he has with Donald Trump? Look, there's, there's clearly something there, I think, that is beyond policy. I mean, it's, de it's the degree to which Nigel Farage has been embraced by the Trump circle and by Donald Trump himself that I think is so interesting, and the degree to which the Trump administration is now starting to talk about elections in France and elections in Germany and looking at this populist movement. And you wonder whether Nigel Farage isn't nudging them in that direction as well. I, I can't help but wonder.